Masonic Medical Center. And today, for the next 25 minutes, we're going to be talking about breast health, cancer, and prevention. Joining me today is Dr. Rosalinda Alvarado with Advocate Illinois Masonic Medical Center. Thank you for being on the show. Thanks for inviting me. Well, I know that you were here not too long ago, and we did this wonderful show on this topic in Spanish, right. very well received by our viewers. And I want to also remind our viewers that our lines are open. The number's at the bottom of your screen at area code 312-738-1060. Dr. Alvarado, I know that uh, the American Cancer Society has had some new estimates and new cases on breast health and breast cancer in the United States, and especially with these numbers in 2015. And still, very surprising, with all the technology, all the prevention, and all these new things that are happening, these numbers continue to grow. They're alarming numbers. I know it was estimated that over 231 cases, or closer to 232,000 new cases of breast cancer was diagnosed among women. And, and it goes on to approximate and what's going to happen, as well as men being diagnosed with over 23,000 of 2,300 cases. Right. So, Dr. Alvarado, can you tell us exactly what is breast cancer? I mean, everyone says, okay, we mention breast cancer, we talk about breast cancer, but really, what is breast cancer? Uh, to explain what breast cancer is, it's important to understand what cancer is in general, and that basically means that there's been an error or a mutation in a gene in our DNA that has um, been allowed to proliferate and uh, move forward without any correction by the body. Uh, when that happens, um, a tumor is uh, able to form and grow as these uh, cancer cells uh, divide rapidly. Um, when we talk about breast cancer, this mm -hmm. process is happening and originating in the breast. Typically, it comes from one of two cells, either the ducts, mm -hmm. which are the tubes uh, that travel inside of our uh, breast tissue and deliver breast milk to our infants if we decide to breastfeed. And then uh, the other cell that they can arise from are the mm -hmm. lobules, mm -hmm. which are the tissues um, that the breast milk uh, is developed from. So typically breast cancer is either gonna come from the ducts or mm -hmm. the lobules, and then there's other forms that are rarer types just depending on the cell of mm -hmm. origin. But it's basically an error in our DNA uh, or a mutation that has gone undetected by the body and is allowed to proliferate and grow uh, without control. And then once it's able to be detected by either a mammogram or a physical exam or what have you, then we're able to see the abnormality, whether mm -hmm. it be calcifications yeah. on a mammogram or um, a mass on a mammogram or an actual palpable mass that um, the physician or the patient can feel. Mm. I know that a lot of discussion has been had, too, as to whether sex or race plays a factor in getting breast cancer mm -hmm. as well. I want to touch a little bit on that because I know a lot of times people are saying, oh, you know, you hear all the time statistically, demographically, you know, these changes, and that uh, more when men, women of color and more men of color and so on. So can we get a little bit into the details of whether or not mm -hmm. this actually plays a role? Mm -hmm. uh, so for breast cancer, the two biggest risk factors are being a woman and uh, getting older. So yes, you know, men can get breast cancer, but it's um, much less likely than a woman. Of 100 cases of breast cancer, one of those will be a man. So 99 are mm -hmm. gonna be in women. So that kind of makes sense to us because when we think of breast cancer, we mainly think of women. And then getting older, because as we get older, we're more likely to develop these mutations that may uh, go undetected or corrected by the body, and then uh, we get cancer. So as we get older, the chance of any cancer really goes up, but in particular breast cancer for women. Um, as far as race, um, we still see the most uh, or the highest incidence of breast cancer in Caucasian women, but I think uh, where minorities come in is that in Latina women and African American women, uh, when they are diagnosed with breast cancer, they tend to have the more aggressive forms. So that's really the difference. So it's not that African American women or Latina mm -hmm. women uh, are more likely to get breast cancer because that's actually not okay. the case. But when they do get breast cancer, they tend to get the more aggressive forms, um, which is unfortunate. Right. And also we've noticed that the rates of mortality are gonna be higher, and it's probably because these cancers are detected um, uh, to be more aggressive. So when you're saying they're aggressive, what do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, there's different ways to classify breast cancer. As I said earlier, one is to classify it as a ductal or a lobular cancer. Uh, other things that we look at are the hormone receptors, for example, mm -hmm. estrogen and progesterone receptors, and then uh, something else called the HER2 new. Yeah. And, uh, you know, depending on what those markers look like in that particular patient's breast cancer, uh, we are able to say whether it's a more or less aggressive form of cancer. So uh, some people may have heard of triple negative breast cancer, and that's classically known to be one of the more aggressive forms of breast cancer. And we see a higher incidence of that in minority women, for example. Wow. So, I mean, it really explains a lot. I do want to remind our viewers that this is a live show. And if you do have questions for Dr. Alvarado, please give us a call. Lines are now open at area code 312-738-1060. The number's at the bottom of your screen. Perfect time to ask questions should you have them. Um, Dr. Alvarado, are there signs and symptoms for breast cancer? Mm -hmm. Typically, uh, and what I as a physician like to see is when there's no symptoms, because that means that this was detected by a mammogram, and typically if a cancer is detected by a mammogram, it's going to be smaller at an earlier state, uh, likely to be curable. However, um, if that is not the case, there can be si signs and symptoms associated with breast cancer. Uh, one can be a change in the color or the texture of the skin, mm -hmm. like redness, uh, dimpling of the skin, uh, an orange peel look mm -hmm. to it. That tends to be associated with more aggressive forms of breast cancer. Um, sometimes it's just feeling a lump in the breast. So if someone feels a lump in their breast that was not there, for example, the month prior, uh, they may want to get that checked out by their physician to see if it's something of concern because there are benign tumors that it could mm -hmm. be as well. Um, there could be nipple discharge, um, particularly if it comes on all of a sudden or spontaneously mm -hmm. and is bloody, that could be a sign of breast cancer. Uh, pain um, has been shown to be associated with breast cancer, although pretty rarely. Mm -hmm. Most uh, patients who experience breast pain actually don't have cancer, mm -hmm. but in uh, some circumstances that can be a sign or a symptom of breast cancer. Uh, so, you know, that's, you know, some of the main right. symptoms that we tend right. to see. But uh, like I said, usually we uh, are hoping patients are getting their screening so that they're not waiting until they have right. a symptom right. uh, to be diagnosed. Right. Now, I know a while ago, this was a big controversy mm -hmm. about soft breast exams mm -hmm. and whether or not women should be doing these. Doctor, what's your opinion on that? I have my opinion, and I ha and there are guidelines associated with this. Um, the American Cancer Society and the task force uh, tend to discourage women from performing self-exams. Uh, they feel that uh, sometimes they are going to be overdiagnosed with things. It's going to lead to unnecessary appointments to the physician, unnecessary mammograms, and ultrasounds. So uh, this tends to be discouraged by um, the task force and by American Cancer Society. Um, what they are promoting is breast self-awareness, so kind of being in tune with what your breast is like and maybe noticing changes there without actually doing a regular self-exam mm -hmm. every month. Um, I tend to see, you know, I, as a breast surgeon, all I see are women with issues in their breasts. So I'm a little bit biased, of course, but I think that, you know, in my practice, I have seen a lot of women who have been diagnosed as a result of their own exam, uh, their partner mm -hmm. feeling a lump on their breast, uh, something of that nature. And I think um, I encourage my patients to be aware of their breast and do self-exams at least once a month. But again, that is off of a guideline. Um, right. The guidelines don't recommend that. I personally don't see the harm in it, so I do tend to advise my patients to do it. Mm -hmm. Just because anecdotally, I have seen so, so many women uh, self-diagnose themselves. And unfortunately, I see a lot of women in my practice who are under the age of 45 and 40 who are not getting regular screening because it's not indicated, mm -hmm. but because they examined themselves, uh, were able to feel a mass and uh, led, led to their diagnosis and ultimate mm -hmm. cure. And you hear these stories all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if you're looking at AM stories and news clippings and, and so on, you're hearing this all the time that it was that they found it was because they felt it, right. not through an exam, but because they felt it. And I tend to agree with you as well. Mm -hmm. No one knows your body the way you do. Right. And no one's going to feel it the way you do. Right. So obviously, I tend to agree with you. I, I Again, maybe it's not part of the guidelines, but ladies, you know what you need to do. <laughs> so Dr. Alvarado, again, the, the question comes up to obviously cancer in general. Mm -hmm. It's something you can inherit, mm -hmm. is it? Yes, it is. Um, I would say, though, that about 80%, if not more, of diagnosed breast cancers are sporadic, meaning that uh, there is no family history. So I oftentimes hear women come to me and say, 
well, I don't really think I need to worry about breast cancer because no one in my family has it. And that's a very huge myth because as I said, most of my patients with breast cancer, again, about mm -hmm. 80% or more of them have no family history of breast cancer, yet they developed breast cancer. So it's something to be very aware of even if you don't have that history. So the other 20% uh, we think uh, are attributed to a family history or a mm -hmm. genetic predisposition. There are some known gene mutations that we know uh, will give someone a higher likelihood of developing breast cancer over their mm -hmm. lifetime, like the BRCA1 and 2 mutations, for example. So um, again, those are the smaller uh, percentages of patients that will actually have those mutations. But yes, there are forms of breast cancer mm -hmm. that can be inherited, as you said. But I think the big takeaway point is just because you don't have a family history doesn't mean you right. cannot get breast cancer. So let me ask you this. Now, I know that in today's uh, technology and medicine, we have types of screenings and labs that we can possibly do for genetics. Mm -hmm. Is that something that is recommended, especially if it runs in the family? Yeah, so if a patient has a family history of breast cancer and it's fairly significant, I usually um, do an initial screening in my office, for example, and ask the key questions that would trigger me to then want to send the patient to genetic counseling and possible testing. So uh, some of these things that mm -hmm. would drive me to do that is a woman who herself is diagnosed right. in a, at a premenopausal age, mm -hmm. so uh, earlier than the age of 50 typically, okay. we want to recommend uh, genetic counseling and screening potentially. If uh, she has a triple negative breast mm -hmm. cancer, that cancer I talked about before, and she's under 60, then I would recommend it right. as well because those tend to be um, clustered uh, in families as well. Uh, if there's a male in the family with breast cancer, again, that's such a rare occurrence right. that we are concerned there that there may be a genetic predisposition, a personal or family history of, mm -hmm. of ovarian cancer, uh, multiple family members, especially on the same side of the family, right. maternal right. or paternal, uh, with early um, breast cancer, again, premenopausal. Right. Um, males in the family with early onset prostate cancer can also right. be uh, something of concern. So there's a long laundry right. list right. that I kind of go through with my patients to do that initial screen and if they meet the qualifications I send them to genetic mm -hmm. counseling and then uh, they would decide with the counselor whether or not they want to do testing and typically if they meet guidelines um, and their insurance company mm -hmm. is reasonable it tends to be paid for. Oh that's wonderful to know. Dr. Alvarado we have a caller. Hello? Yes good evening. Uh, I'm a male and uh, about four or five years ago I was taking a shower and I was, you know, I, you know what, let me see this. So I set my head, patted myself down, and sure enough, yeah. I felt something on my breast. I went to the doctor. I went to the doctor. They took a biopsy and all of that stuff. Sure enough, but I was lucky not to have anything. Okay. But to, to tell all the males on, that call on your show, hey, it, it's just as important for you to to yourself as it is the women, if you're starting to feel bad or anything, it could just might save your life. You think that I didn't have it. So if mm -hmm. I would have had it, you know, the self-examination would have been the way to go. And thank God for this program and thank God for you guys and keep up the good work and talk a little bit more about the mail. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I think I think that's a very good point. Um, I've I've seen you know again many women and some men in my practice who come to me because they have mm -hmm. uh, felt something in their in their chest wall that wasn't there before, and most oftentimes, as as happened in the case of the caller, it ends up being nothing. But um, it could be something. So I think it's very important to be in tune with your body, trust your instinct, and just get it checked out. The worst thing that can happen is that you're told it's nothing, and then right. you can be relieved. Right, right. Yeah. And it's really exciting to see that these genetic testings are available today. Mm -hmm. And again, if being diligent about it, insurance companies will cover it. Te uh, technically, technically yes. right? Typically, typically they yes. would. So, Doctor, I know that also th there's always a lot of concern, too. So once you've been diagnosed and all that's happened, now you're thinking about all the therapies that need to happen, such as chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. And I know that many of these have side effects, and for some people it's worse than others. Can we talk a little bit about that? I think uh, what you just said uh, is the key point, that some people is worse than others. Um, and some people don't need uh, one treatment while okay. as another person will. 
Uh, there are many patients with breast cancer who maybe will only need surgery and that will cure them and that's sufficient uh, treatment for them depending on the size of the tumor, the type of tumor that it is, and the specific biology of the mm -hmm. tumor. And it gets very complicated. So uh, breast cancer care is very multidisciplinary and I think that's the key. So anyone out there watching who uh, may have breast cancer or know somebody who does, mm -hmm. I think the key is working with a team. Um, I'm the surgeon and I feel that I'm very uh, a very important component of that team, but just as important is the medical mm -hmm. oncologist, the radiation oncologist, the genetic counselor mm -hmm. in some cases. Uh, there's usually a breast health navigator involved. It's a full team approach and uh, sometimes portions of the team are going to be more utilized than others. Mm -hmm. uh, some patients may not need radiation, for example, as well. Uh, many or most patients who have a lumpectomy, for example, uh, that's where just a portion of the breast is removed as opposed to the entire breast, they tend to need radiation therapy. But that same patient uh, who needs radiation may not need chemotherapy. Or the patient who needed the mastectomy needs chemotherapy mm -hmm. and maybe even needs another treatment called Herceptin, which lasts for a year. And that's based on that HER2 marker okay. that I talked about okay. before. So that's why I think uh, and know that multidisciplinary care and that approach Approach to the breast cancer patient is going to be the best and lead to the best outcomes because it's mm -hmm. the most individualized way to treat a patient as opposed to just treating everybody the same because um, again those treatments aren't uniform mm -hmm. they're not going to treat everybody in the same way and in some cases we would be over treating patients <coughs> who otherwise wouldn't need right. uh, that chemotherapy right. that can be very toxic to patients. I do want to remind our viewers with us today I've got a feather in my throat <laughs> Excuse me, that Dr. Rosalinda Avarado is with us today. And we're talking about breast health, breast cancer, and prevention. Dr. Rosalinda can be reached at, um, she's over located at 3000 North Austin in Suite 711. And if you have any questions, you can reach her office at 773 area code 296 3390. Or if you need additional information, obviously you can reach the American Cancer Society at 1-800-227-2345. 1-800-227-2345. So those are the things that, that are happening. But we also talk about the side, we talked a little bit about the side effects and what can happen, again, depending on the individual. And it varies from person to person. Right. I'll touch on that no, for a little ahead. bit. So again, uh, part of the diagnosis, you know, we treat women, uh, well, mainly women. Again, some men get breast cancer, but it's going to depend on their age of presentation. What other comorbidities do they have? Is this a uh, older, sicker mm -hmm. woman who, for example, has had a heart attack in the past, a stroke, maybe she's a brittle diabetic. Um, all these things are going to play take into account. So we are not likely to give someone who has all of these comorbidities mm -hmm. a toxic medication like chemotherapy because she may mm -hmm. not uh, simply be able to tolerate mm -hmm. it. So we want to make sure that all of the treatment we provide, whether it's surgical, uh, chemotherapy, radiation, etc., is going to help prolong the patient's mm -hmm. life, but also give her a good quality of life. Sure. If we're going to affect those things, then we have to balance our treatment with our long-term goals uh, of the patient and, and her family as well. Right. So it tends to be a long discussion. For uh, those patients who end up um, being recommended mm -hmm. chemotherapy because we feel that it's necessary uh, to give them the best outcome, we talk uh, with the patient uh, and her family mm -hmm. if they're involved about what the potential side effects would be, what medications or other therapies we can do to try to, uh, you know, kind of uh, mediate those uh, side effects so that they're minimal if possible and really work with the patient to individualize things and through the treatment you know uh, things may happen the patient may develop an infection or a complication but for the most part if patients are selected well based on their comorbidities they tend to tolerate right. the treatment well um, it is not a fun experience any patient who's been through chemo will tell you that but once it's over I think that they are able to get back to their normal activity after several weeks or even mm -hmm. months uh, and, and live their normal life. But we really have to work with the patient together and include their primary care mm -hmm. physician as well to make sure that we're properly selecting patients for these treatments mm -hmm. that we end up recommending because they can be very difficult. Thank you for that. Doctor, I was hoping that since we're talking about this, we're also at Illinois Masonic Medical Center. We had a program that we do every year and there's one that's coming up. And obviously we want to invite the viewers to attend. For those of you I'd like to share this with you. Let me just get this up here, this information. Let's talk a little bit about that. 
And Dr. Alvarado, if you can just talk a little bit about that for a second. So um, this is a really nice program that we're holding on Saturday, October 8th. It's going to be located on our uh, Illinois Masonic campus. It's going to be a Saturday event. Uh, it'll start basically with a registration, refreshment, so that everybody can chat and mingle for a little bit. And then there's going to be a presentation. Uh, typically, we do the presentation in Spanish and in English uh, to accommodate both uh, groups. And then uh, we do clinical breast exams for patients that desire them. So that's done on the same day. Uh, usually by myself and um, some other physicians who are involved in the program um, and it's really nice we can teach patients you know about self exams uh, what we're looking for during the examination as mm -hmm. well and something new uh, that we're doing this year is scheduling women for their free mammograms if uh, they need that wow. for women who are underinsured or uninsured and um, haven't had a mammogram or maybe they're behind yeah. on their mammogram I think this will be a very nice opportunity for these women to be able to get that screening that they really need we're going to have ALAS um, Wings, which is mm -hmm. a very fantastic organization that works with breast cancer survivors. And they're going to have a mobile salon uh, to show uh, bras, prosthetics, wigs. Uh, to cancer patients, mm -hmm. and uh, they're even going to provide some goodies uh, for the patients that need them. So it's really going to be a nice, uh, fun event uh, with a lot of resources provided yes, to our yes. community. So yeah. I would encourage people to come if they can. Well, we're really excited about this. This is something that has spinal care has been working with with Illinois Masonic Medical Center for many, many years. And it's our annual event. Uh, again, as Dr. mentioned, Alice will be there, who will be providing free wigs and prosthesis for women in need. We do ask that you pre-register for that because we do need a wig color and bra sizes for those women in need. And then it is limited to the first 15 or 20 women. So you can always call and register for that either by calling uh, his spinal care or calling uh, the 1-800 number in which you can reach us over, and it's right here, 1-800-3-ADVOCATE or 1-800-323-8622 or his spinal care number. Either one of those numbers you can reach us at and register for this event. Again, both in English and in Spanish. Um, both programs, two speakers. Dr. Alvarado will be our Spanish presenter. Thank you so much. And Dr. Maurer of Advocate Illinois Masonic Medical Center will also be presenting in the English. So, Doctor, I know we talked a little bit about the chemotherapies, but there's also questions about the um, uh, tamoxifen mm -hmm. and effects of that. Is that something that women should worry about? Because it seems like... At least what I'm hearing, that's the first thing that's, that seems like it's being offered for mm -hmm. as far as a, a type of treatment. Mm -hmm. So again, it's one of those things that's individualized to the patient and the type of cancer that they have. But typically, um, if a patient has an estrogen receptor positive mm -hmm. tumor, like we talked about mm -hmm. earlier, um, as part of their treatment, they may be offered endocrine therapy in the form of tamoxifen, mm -hmm. like you said, and there's other forms of this medication as well. And uh, like any medication, if you read the fine print, it's going to have potential side effects. Yeah. Uh, some women uh, will experience many of them, and some women will experience none of them, and it's very very individual mm -hmm. how that goes. Uh, typically, if we recommend this treatment, it can be for a duration of five to 10 years. So it is a commitment. However, if a woman starts to take it mm -hmm. and it has very severe side effects where the medication cannot be tolerated, then we may switch her to a different form of therapy. Typically, what women worry about with tamoxifen would be a decreased libido. They may mm -hmm. feel like they're going through menopause again, the hot flashes. Um, and then there can be more serious side sure. effects like endometrial cancer, which is very rare, or blood clots, for example. So it's something that needs to be uh, talked through with their oncologist. Mm -hmm. And if the benefits are felt to outweigh the risk, then this medication mm -hmm. will be recommended. All right. So, doctor, is radiation from a mammogram harmful? You, you get that question all the time, I'm sure. I do. And uh, the radiation that a, a woman is exposed to in a mammogram is very low, um, especially if it's only done once a year. Uh, so uh, we do feel that it is very safe, and it's a relative thing. One thing you'll hear physicians talk about over and over mm -hmm. again is what is the benefit to risk ratio. And uh, we know that there is a large benefit to screening with mammography for detecting early breast cancer, and we feel that that outweighs the potential mm -hmm. risk uh, of radiation. So again, mm -hmm. that risk needs to be weighed. These need to be at regular intervals divided, decided upon with the patient and their physician to make sure right. that it is safe. Right. Dr. Alvarado, thank you so much for being here with us and discussing this such an important topic. And it's never, we can never speak about this enough. 
It's got to be an ongoing issue. And still, right. there was so much more that we want to talk about, but you can only do so much in such a short period of time. Right. But I would yeah. love to have you back. Of course. Uh, so, yeah. Dr. Arbo, thank you so much. So, on behalf of all my colleagues at Hispano Care, Advocate Illinois Masonic Medical Center, Dr. Rosalinda Alvarado, thank you again for sharing this important information. And, and Illinois Masonic, thank you for your continuing support of bilingual bicultural health care to the Latino communities and all communities of the Chicagoland area. My name is Lucia Aquino, and I represent his final care at Illinois Masonic. So, until next time, stay tuned. Lots more information coming your way. Until next time, have a good evening.